Hello and welcome. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll meet with artist Gene Ranstrom of Alvarado, Minnesota. But first, our guest is Linda Coates, who wears many hats, a music producer, Fargo uh, school board member, and other many other things. But today you're here to talk about the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony. Right. And okay. thanks so much for having me. <laughs> well, thanks for being here today. For, as we start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I was born and raised in Jamestown, North Dakota. So uh, been in the Prairie Public Territory all my life. Um, came to Fargo-Moorhead to go to college and pretty much made my career here both in teaching and in arts administration and we, my husband and I have a music business as well, recording business. Now how did you come to be involved with the FM Symphony? Uh, at the time I was executive director of the local arts council uh, when this job opened up in 1993 and so my first stint as executive director of the symphony was actually 93 to 96 and then my husband and I opened our business and it got to be a little too much to try to do both so I left on good terms and then uh, just a few years ago the symphony had gone through some staff changes and they asked me to come back so this is actually my second stint with the symphony that I began in 2007 so it's wonderful to be back. 2007 till present. Till, okay. Yep, till now. Well, tell us a little bit about the symphony and the season that's now underway. Sure. Well, the symphony is in its 78th year. We're almost 80 years old. Um, it's a fully professional symphony. All of the uh, players in the symphony are admitted through a very uh, rigorous audition, and they're all paid for rehearsals and performances. And our music director is uh, Bernie Rubenstein from Santa Fe. He comes up for the concert periods. And we're embarking on a season called Taste the World. And what we wanted to do this year is something different uh, with the music. Oh, you have our uh, wonderful brochure here. Uh, what we like to do is combine art uh, in a visual way with our season. So we commission an artwork every year. So that wonderful painting on the front is by Karen Bakke. But um, this year we did something a little different with the music. Uh, each Masterworks concert uh, program is grouped around a particular country or locale. And that's not a real typical way of, of presenting a symphony concert. But for example, we have music of Spain, music of France, music of Austria, music or Vienna, music of um, America, and then ending up with music of Russia. And so we have partnered up with several restaurants in Fargo-Moorhead and uh, five times a year they're going to come up with specific uh, special menus of cuisine to match our concerts. So you can go out for a dinner and enjoy the food of Spain and then go hear Spanish music or for, have a French dinner and go out and hear music by French composers. So uh, we're really excited about this. Uh, we have a lot of new season subscribers that said the food thing sealed the deal you know who doesn't like food so we're very excited oh, that does sound interesting you talked a little bit about uh, your conductor of course mm -hmm. being from santa fe and uh, you say he's in his eighth year i believe but can, yep. can you give us a little bit more maybe about his background and... yep uh bernie has studied with leading conductors uh around the country he's uh, had a very long career as a conductor and right now he makes his home in santa fe he has uh, conducted in, in Tulsa and Texas. He still goes down and, and conducts ballets in Texas every uh, Christmas time. So he's, he's someplace warm every December. So, <laughs> But uh, we just adore Bernie. He takes very good care of us, and he's just done a wonderful job for the symphony. Can you talk about how a symphony uh, sort of works in a sort of a medium-sized city? Sure. Like well, uh, it's a very compressed schedule, for example. And all the music, many musicians are... Uh, professionals in music in some way or another. They're college professors or they're local teachers, uh, and some are in other fields but are play at a professional level. Um, but it's a very grueling week for the musicians. Uh, the Saturday before the concert, or excuse me, the Sunday before the concert is the first rehearsal. The rehearsals are two and a half hours long at, at night. So Sunday is a full rehearsal. Monday is just strings. Tuesday is a full rehearsal. Wednesday is off. Thursday is a full rehearsal with the guest artists. Friday's dress rehearsal. Saturday and Sunday are concerts. So if you if you teach all day or work all day, and then you grab something to eat, and then you concentrate very hard for two and a half hours day after day, it's a it's a grueling week for the musicians, but they they love it. And there's always a lot of competition for every every time there's an open seat. Well, and you say that, Mr. Rubenstein. Obviously, you've already said lives in Santa Fe, but 
Do most of the players uh, in the orchestra, are they from the area? Or? Absolutely. We're pretty proud that we don't bring in ringers, um, that the orchestra is absolutely the talent of Fargo-Moorhead and the, mm -hmm. the surrounding region. We have several that drive in as far as um, uh, kind of the Fergus Falls, the, the Lakes area, folks that live there, some folks from Grand Forks travel down at their expense. Um, we don't reimburse mileage because we figure we're going to treat all the musicians the same and if they want to come and play and and that's kind of been our tradition. We've even had a few uh, people come up from Minneapolis to take mm -hmm. principal positions in our orchestra. So it's a it's a fabulous uh, orchestra. We're very proud of it. Well you probably already answered this question but Will people be surprised at how much musical talent there is in this region? Well, I think uh, if you haven't been to a symphony concert, that might be your first impression. But, you know, some of the musicians, when, when you look at the folks who are on stage, there are many who perform at a national level. I mean, I can uh, point to any number of folks who perform as guests themselves all over the country and that uh, teach at the local colleges and universities and some have done recordings that have been professionally released and so just a wonderful depth of talent and the fact that we have three colleges and universities each one with a sizable uh, high quality music department means that there's a there's a very deep bench to draw on for uh, faculty members and also a handful of students every year a few students um, audition and make it, particularly in the uh, string sections where we need more musicians. Uh, I think every year since I've been back, there have even been two or three high school, play, outstanding high school players uh, in the orchestra, which is a fantastic experience for them. Okay. Well, t tell us some about your recent concerts, uh, like Bach on Broadway and the music of Spain. Sure. We do two kinds of series. One is the Masterwork series, the big orchestra and the concert hall that, that uh, people might be familiar with. But we also do a chamber music series and that is a lot of fun. Um, chamber music is uh, I guess defined by us as music that's done by a small number of people. It can be any, anyone from a duo to a quartet, quintet, even a small chamber size orchestra, typically without a conductor. And so it's a chance to see kind of the virtuosity of those musicians a little more up close and personal, a little more informally, and so that's uh, some of the favorite uh, concerts um, of mine personally. I just love that series. This year we, we did something a little different. Normally that series takes place in a church in downtown Fargo that has just wonderful acoustics, but we started the chamber series this year with a chamber-sized orchestra, and our uh, associate conductor, Jane Lindy Capistran, had the idea Inspired by a guest conductor we had last year from Cuba, Zenaida Romeu, who back in her homeland of Cuba had an all-female chamber orchestra, Jane said, I think I'll do that this year. So she put together the women, or many of the women of the orchestra, and did a chamber size orchestra with, um, we called it Bach on Broadway because of the size of the ensemble we performed at the Fargo Theater instead. So we had did quite a bit of Bach and some other pieces, and it was just fantastic. It was a lot of fun. And then, uh, just scheduling-wise, it happened that the chamber uh, orchestra opened the season. But then our, our big opener of the um, Sanford Health Masterworks series was with uh, a big star that we brought in, cellist Zul Bailey, who was just amazing. And that was uh, just a transcendent concert. Fiery music and his performance is just um, He's one of the top cellists in the country right now, and uh, we're just so pleased to have him. He was here several years ago, and it was just a thrill to bring him back. Hmm. Well, you know, you talked some about your Masterworks series, mm -hmm. but can you expand on that a little bit for us? Sure. Um, the, the Masterworks series is when the orchestra has the chance to present the whole span of orchestral repertoire. It might be something from a long time ago, like the, every once in a while we do some pieces from the Baroque era, like the Bach or Vivaldi or something like that, uh, all through up to pieces that are contemporary. And like I said, this year it's kind of fun grouping them around um, different countries. And the music, the concert that we just had, the music of Spain, What's interesting about that is if you look at the pieces performed, they're not all by Spanish composers. Uh, in the uh, Romantic period, the 1800s in particular, early 1900s, 
composers were really intrigued by the music of Spain and the whole Spanish culture and kind of the exoticism of, of some of its folk music. So a lot of composers drew on that material for inspiration. So we had um, a Russian composer, Rimsky-Korsakov, and uh, uh, I'm kind of blanking out a German, uh, Strauss, and, and one Spanish composer, but all the music sounded totally Spanish. Uh, the rest of the season, um, the pieces are by, so for example, the next season, uh, concert coming up, Music of France, uh, all French composers, and the music is just, just has that French um, je ne sais quoi, that what can I say, that, that French uh, wonderful shimmering sound to it. Well, one of the things you mentioned a little bit briefly is, is you, ha you commission an art piece now. Right. Is this something you've been doing for how long? Or? You know, I started that when I was at the symphony in the 90s, and uh, it was always an exciting collaboration to first figure out what the theme of the coming year is going to be, uh, match up uh, who would be a great artist to make that theme come to life, and we've had the wonderful opportunity to work with some of the best graphic artists uh, and, and visual artists in the region over the years, and so this was really fun. Karen Bakke, uh, she's known for a lot of her large-scale murals that are in um, buildings and institutions all over the all over the region, so it was really fun to have her work on this. And I didn't know what she was going to come up with. I kind of gave her the uh, all the information about the pieces and the composers and the, the idea of the food and the music going together, and I think she just did a really ingenious approach where in the background, kind of the misty background, are edifices from each country, mm -hmm. you know, the, the what is it, St. Petersburg Cathedral and and, you know the Eiffel Tower and and so forth and then but what's what's up front and just luscious and colorful is the food of you know potatoes mm -hmm. from Russia and the, of course the pear and the grapes from France so it was, it was just brilliant. Okay, well, good. Uh, there are also family concerts I understand. Can you tell yep. us about what, what that means? Yeah we have a lot of fun every December with our holiday pops concerts and that's the only time that the full orchestra performs downtown uh, at the Fargo Theater. Most of the time we're at the NDSU Festival Concert Hall. But uh, at the Fargo Theater, we present Holiday Pops concerts, uh, three of them in Fargo, and then one in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, at the Center for the Arts. And those are so fun. We see lots of uh, parents and grandparents bring their little kids. This is a perfect opportunity for that first concert experience. And the pieces are orchestral pieces, but with a lot of variety and with some guests and some sing-alongs and a visit from Santa and the the whole thing, so cookies and cider afterwards. So those holiday pops concerts just before Christmas are a lot of fun. And um, we also encourage young folks to come to the chamber uh, concerts too. I think some people think that the chamber concerts are more of a maybe more esoteric subset of the masterworks and we found it actually works just the opposite because the pieces are a little shorter and the musicians um, are really wonderful and engaging in describing the music they're about to play and, and often with a lot of humor and the pieces themselves are just usually so uh, brilliant and, and full of kind of virtuosic playing that that also acts as a really great first experience. We have a lot of high school students that come to those. Hmm. Oh, good. And of course I understand the, the Moscow Ballet is coming too and performing the Nutcracker. Yep, uh, that is not going to actually feature the orchestra, but we uh, kind of partnered up with them thinking this is something our audiences will really enjoy and they needed a local partner to help with the ticketing. So we're handling their ticket sales for them and uh, that will kind of hick, kick off the holiday season uh, all, as well in late November at the concert hall. So. The orchestra's not involved, but we're kind of involved as a as a co-presenter, and just think that that's a that'll be a big thrill for local audiences. Okay, well, how is the FM Symphony funded? Yeah. Um, we're very similar to lots of uh, arts organizations, nonprofits. Um, we try to keep our ticket prices affordable, as most groups do. And so ticket prices only cover a fraction of the cost of what it takes to put on a production and have an organization in place to, to manage the symphony. So our funding pie uh, includes a lot uh, of support from local private donations um, and uh, business donations and sponsorships. Uh, we do have some grants and the ticket sales. 
And we do have two major fundraising events every year. We have uh, the Symphony Ball, which has been going for more than 50 years. That's always the first Saturday in December. And then we have one uh, wine and beer on the red, which is a wine and beer tasting event in the spring that actually uh, we took over from mm -hmm. uh, Prairie Public. You're the folks that started it and uh, handed it off to us many years ago, and we've really had fun with it ever since. So thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> Maybe we're, you know, uh, <laughs> no, no, we're yeah. not giving it back. <laughs> well, so, so, I mean, people can become members? Um, yeah, yeah so. we don't have membership per se, but um, uh, any kind of uh, ticketing, if they, anyone wants to come to any of the concerts, our tickets for the first time this year are uh, available online. You can just you know, go to the website and uh, pick your seat, pick your ticket, pay for it, and print it out on your printer. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and uh, to donate to the symphony is, I guess, what, what we call membership, but uh, we really mm -hmm. do rely on contributions over and above the uh, ticket sales for those people who are interested in supporting the symphony. Well, we, uh, we, you've got different locations. You talked about that you do perform, right. but how, how are the crowds at the symphony performances? Uh, they're growing all the time. You know, we hear a lot, and, and I hear a lot, uh, about the symphonies around the, the country in, in my uh, professional literature or whatever. Um, that many symphonies are struggling, and, and some of the big orchestras in the in the big cities are having trouble, and some are really in, in dire straits. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the financial realities around the country that we're unfortunately not, uh, not so much a part of. But um, I'm so encouraged by how our audiences continue to grow and continue to reflect the full gamut of people of our community. Um, when you go to a symphony concert, you'll see high school kids, college kids, young adults, families, as well as, you know, people who are elderly or retired, I think, that you think of as the typical symphony audience. But I think that really comes down to some uh, very compelling reasons. Uh, music education in this part of the country is so strong and so, such a highly held value that those people uh, grow up enjoying music when they're in school and seeking out good musical experiences uh, in their youth and as they grow up and involve their families. And it's just a, a real part of our, the essence of our community. And I think uh, we really see that. There's also a very wonderful, high quality uh, youth orchestra in town. The Ephemeria Youth Symphonies actually has two orchestras. The Junior High String Orchestra that I think has had up to 80 kids in it and the uh, Senior High Symphony, which is a full symphony orchestra made of kids from 9th through 12th grade. And so we are really steeped in high quality music around here and that shows up in our audiences. Wow. Well, how does your uh, being a music producer help in your job? Well, it's fun because um, as I said, in 95, my husband and I started a recording studio and we've done some uh, CD releases of all sorts of kinds of music. And um, it gives me a greater appreciation for the uh, uh, technical aspect of what goes into uh, what you hope seems like an effortless production. And it also, um, I have a very wide ranging musical taste and so sometimes we can, uh, working together with Bernie who has terrific ideas, hopefully come up with uh, fun programs for our audiences. Well, can you talk about the magic of music and what it means to you? Um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't know if uh, if my parents thought me going into music was all that magical back when I was a kid, but it has turned out to be the plays the central role in my life. Every um, kind of zigzag my career has taken has always been uh, not very far from music. So it's it's uh, pretty much the central core to my life, and I know it makes uh, many people's lives much richer. Well, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, my question is, how do you continue to get young people, and for that matter, anybody, you know, involved in uh, classical music and getting involved with mm -hmm. the symphony? Well, I think it's important to realize that people seek out experiences that mean something to them and that, that, that has a personal connection. Uh, people aren't very likely 
to seek out something that's just completely unusual or strange or scary or intimidating. And so uh, what we really try to do is become more and more uh, of a part of just the fabric of our community's life. You know, we're surrounded by classical music all the time. Uh, it's the soundtrack to a lot of, you know, film and TV and, and radio. I mean, you, you kind of hear it without necessarily always knowing, oh, this is that particular piece. Uh, but when you see it performed in front of you with, with musicians who are part of your community, and, and see them make that piece come to life. It's a very powerful thing. And I think it's important to mix up some familiar pieces that people can kind of grab onto. Like, oh, oh, I, I get it. And then you kind of uh, go from there. But we try never to lose sight of what that first listening experience is like. Mm -hmm. So that any concert you come to as a newcomer uh, will be a, a pleasant and exciting experience. Linda, if people want more information or to purchase tickets, uh, where can they go? Yep, everything's on our website at fmsymphony.org, or they can give us a call at 218-233-8397. Linda, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. What a thrill to be here. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. Jean Randstrom of Alvarado, Minnesota, is a painter who explores vibrant landscapes in her work. Here's a profile of Jean Randstrom. have the opportune day that you could ask for and say, okay, God, I'm going out to paint tomorrow and here's what I want. I would like about 65 degrees. I want no wind. I would like high overcast and no bugs. You would think you died and gone to heaven, but you might get one or two out of that list. Okay, well, this would be perfect. I am an oil painter and a pastelist. I basically started at 10 years of age. A neighbor lady asked my twin and I to come over and sit, she wanted to paint our portraits and I was completely intrigued with watching her put paint on a canvas. I have painted almost continuously, so I basically started at 10 years of age. I primarily paint still life, landscapes, do a lot of pet portraiture, I do not paint people. In the last years, plein air became something that was very, very important to me, and so I was outdoors painting a lot. So I am seeing, with all this yellow-green, I'm seeing a purple. Plein air painting means to be painting in the air, outside, and it is probably the fastest growing genre right now in the United States. It offers a tremendous amount of challenges. First of all, you have roughly a half hour to catch a light pattern in whatever it is you're painting. And then if you're able to edit everything out and only get in your lights, your middle tones, and your shadows, you can then work for approximately another hour on that piece and still have a sense of the time that you did this. And it truly is a skill builder. Other than the fact you need to watch for anthills and snakes and critters and bugs and rain and thunder and snow and those things. Plein air is really a lot of fun. To keep everything from getting wet. So we'll just kind of wait it out. My husband would be the very first one to tell you, if I get crabby, he just tells me to go to the studio. I can relax. I can have been out in the garden and be exhausted and come here into the studio and pick up a pastel or my paintbrush and my paint and for two hours I'm totally lost. It's like another world. I'm relaxed even when I'm struggling with a painting. As a painter what I feel is while you are trying to decide what color of green you need to put on that tree and where because you're totally absorbed in what you're doing. You cannot be worrying about 
whether the car is going to need to be repaired or whether you've got money for rent or some of the other daily problems that you have. And so for me, it is just like a fantastic relaxation. I paint pretty much what feels interesting and fun to me. And I think if I'm enjoying it, I'm hoping that somebody else will enjoy it. And so far it's worked out pretty well. I probably could sell a whole lot more paintings if I did not follow my heart and what I really enjoy and want to paint. So I really don't paint for fashion at all. I think my biggest nightmare is people that would come into our studio and they would have all their swatches and they say, we need a painting to match the sofa. So I have a t-shirt that says, good art does not have to match the sofa. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.